Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Timmy asked if I would say a few things about myself. I just met him this morning, so we'll give him a pass. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm Chad Caldwell, um, and I'm a believer in Christ. I'm a Christian. Amen. Right? Is that that's the most important thing, in my opinion. Um, uh, there are some other important things as well, though, uh, not equally important, but, you know, I'll tell you a few other details if you're interested. Um, uh, I, my wife, Cheryl, she couldn't be here today. She's teaching Sunday school at our home church, um, and she took the kids with them. So we have two kids, Linnea and Peter. Linnea just celebrated her 11th birthday uh, on Thanksgiving. So... We we're always very tickled that she was born on Thanksgiving Day, and every now and then she gets to celebrate her birthday on Thanksgiving. Uh, Peter is six. Okay, so we have two young children. I teach at SBU. Um, I'm a painter. I, I make paintings. I make art. So I teach painting. I teach drawing and a little bit of art history um, and, and occasionally other things uh, as need be. So I'm originally from Pennsylvania. So I was telling your, your deacons here this morning that you know, I'm still trying to um, learn Missouri culture. It's quite a bit it's quite a bit different, but it's good. It's not a bad difference. It's a it's a it's a good difference. Uh, we really enjoy being here in this area. Um, so anyway, uh, I guess maybe enough about me for now. And then, uh, you know, if anybody uh, is interested in talking with me or um, emailing or whatever, you could probably talk with Dennis and you, you're, or one of, maybe one of the other deacons, and you're welcome to reach out and contact me. They can give you my contact information. That would be fine. Uh, but uh, let's, let's start with prayer this morning. So if you bow your heads, please. Father, we just uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here in the flesh. Um, uh, we are appreciating one another more, I think, these days. You're, you're, uh, this COVID thing is bad. We, we need help to get through it. We need your help. And thank you for teaching us lessons through it. And thank you for opening our eyes to recognize the importance of being together when, when possible. And uh, for those who can't be here, we're just so grateful that they can listen in by radio or they can see... Uh, videos and, and worship in that way, in, in a way that's physically safe for them. And, uh, but thank you for allowing us to, to gather in, in these multiple kinds of ways to continue worshiping you, glorifying you, learning from you. And we just thank you. I pray that you would speak through this sermon this morning, that we would hear you and you would keep me out of the way. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So imagine what it would be like if you couldn't recognize anybody. If you would see them, and you would see their face, you'd be with them face to face, and you couldn't recognize them, e even if it was a family member. It could be your spouse. It's hard probably for most of us to imagine. Um, it could be a spouse. It could be a, a good friend. It could be... Um, you know, maybe a neighbor, but you don't have the ability to look at their face and recognize them by seeing them. You would have to use other kinds of context clues, like hearing their voice or, you know, where they're standing. You know, if they're standing in the front yard, chances are that's, that's my neighbor, Ray, right? Because he's mowing the lawn. Um, but I, I wouldn't be able to see the face and recognize him. Imagine how hard that would be. That, there's actually a neurological condition called, it's like, if, forgive me if I can't pronounce it right, it's like prosopagnosia. Okay? It's a neurological condition where people cannot recognize familiar faces, uh, they see a face, they know it's a face, th their eyesight's fine, they might have 20-20 vision, but they can't recognize who the person is, even if it's a loved one, someone that they've seen every day for the last 20 years. Think about how difficult that would be. Um, the kind of social pressures you might feel when you walk into, say, you know, work, and you can't recognize your boss from... Um, you know, other people. Uh, or if you walk in, you're, you're at the grocery store and you see somebody 
and they come up to you and they start talking to you. Oh, Chad, how's it going? I haven't seen you in a while. And you have no idea who it is. We've all experienced that on some level, right? Some, we, but imagine that being the most common experience you, you have because you can't recognize people because of this prosopagnosia. So uh, I, I thought this was really interesting. As a painter, there's actually a, a very famous painter, Chuck Close, who paints self, he paints portraits, self-portraits and portraits of others, and he suffers with prosopagnosia. I think that's a really interesting um, thing on his part, right? He's a portrait, he's known as being one of the great modern portrait painters today. Um, I think what I want to do is use that as kind of an, an illustration for what's going on here in scriptures, okay? So far worse, eternally worse, infinitely worse, then this neurological prosopagnosia. Um, imagine the tragedy of going through life and you are unable to recognize the only one who can satisfy your spiritual thirst. The only one who can lead you into true spiritual worship. Imagine living your entire life unable to recognize Christ as the source of eternal life. You can't, you can't recognize Him. If you were to see the power of Christ demonstrated here and now today, w would we recognize Him? Would we recognize the work He's doing as coming from God? What does it take to recognize God? That's a big question. What does it take to recognize God? Well, the Christian God is not a deistic God, uninvolved, right? The kind of God that is distant and so aloof that, you know, he created the world, but he's not involved. No, the Christian God is involved. He's intimate, intimately involved, and he's at work. He always has been, always will be. Um, so deism, if you're familiar with that word, is, is not Christianity, it's a very common idea today. We believe in a God that is at work. But if you were to witness the saving hand of God, would you know it? And would you know it well enough to ask for it? Would you recognize Christ? What would you need to see? What would you need to hear in order to recognize that Jesus is the source of living water, the source of eternal life? Uh, a big, <laughs> a big question. Maybe I, I'm just going to ask lots of questions. <laughs> right. One of the biggest ones, though, is: Do we today? Do most people today even know that we are spiritually thirsty? That scares me. I, I you know, I'm working with college age kids, and, and they're and they're good kids. They really are. Um. But even at a Christian university, and I love the university I work for, it's nothing about them. It's the culture, the culture that we all live in. I don't know if a lot of the students even recognize their spiritual thirst, and it worries me. They're so distracted. There's so many good things in this life. Even though we're going through this pandemic, there's so many, I want to say good things. They're not necessarily bad things. But they're not the ultimate things. So many distractions. So do people today even recognize that we are spiritually thirsty? Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. And he is at work. What would you need to know in order to truly see him for who he is? To recognize him as the Son of God so that by believing you may have life in his name right this is the this is the point of the gospel of john so that by believing in his name you may have eternal life so there was a woman who experienced these very same concerns she was spiritually blind unable to see jesus she was staring him <laughs> face to face, talking with him, and yet she couldn't really see him. She couldn't see who he was. She could not understand his words. 
Even though she was looking face to face at the Messiah, the incarnate Son of God, she was spiritually unable to recognize Him. And therefore, she was, at least for the moment, unable to worship uh, God at all in spirit and in truth. So, turn with me to John 4. I have a feeling many of you are familiar with this story. And I've gone back and forth over whether or not I should read a really large chunk of this or just dive into the explanation. And I thought, why not? I'm just going to read it. <laughs> it's the Word of God. We should read it. Uh, I won't read the entire chapter, but I'll read a big chunk of it starting at verse 1. Chapter 4 of John, verse 1. So I'm going to read through this, and then I'm going to go back through and uh, try to dig into some explanation. And maybe I'll get to preaching after that. Okay, how's that sound? <laughs> okay. um, verse 1, Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to the town of Samaria called Sakar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside, sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, that's about noon. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, "'Give me a drink.'" For, the, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. The worship You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when tr the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know the Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. Wish we had all the time in the world, because there's even more. But that, that's, a, that's, that's more than we can bite off this morning right there. Okay, that, there's a lot to unpack in here. Um, let me go back. I'm going to read, and I'm going to give you some thoughts. And um, 
uh, and try to explain a little bit about what's happening here. So back in verse 1, it says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. So probably what's happening here is Jesus, he's, he's got a mission. And these Pharisees, they're out to get him. And he realizes he, he just physically, he needs to move on. And he's, he's got things he needs to do. And he can't let them stop him, at least not yet. Right? So he's, he's going to move on. No big deal. And he had to pass through Samaria. Now, John was probably written to a Jewish audience. So he's going to leave a Jewish area and go through Samaria to get to another Jewish area. If you were an ancient Jewish audience, you would have just heard this. Ugh, you would have grunted. He's got to go through Samaria. Are you kidding me? That's a land of outcasts. They intermarried with the, like the Assyrians, and, and they're, they're, they're half-breeds. They're unclean. How could this guy risk that if he thinks he's the Messiah? How could he risk being unclean, ritually unclean in that way? So he came to a town of Samaria called Sakar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. I, I'm not positive about this, but I think this is a really curious addition here. I think that John is saying, hey, listen up to his Jewish audience. He's saying, you know, you're, you're, you're bashing in your minds. I know you're bashing on the Samaritan, Samaria right now, right? Guess what? <laughs> Our forefathers, Jacob, so, you know, he, this was his area. He drank out of this well, right? He, the, Joseph was there, you know? So just listen up. Don't judge too quickly. You need to hear this. Um, maybe that's me kind of taking some guesses as to what's happening as to why he's given some of these details. But I, I'm, I'm, you know, I could be wrong, but I think that helps us a little bit in understanding uh, the original audience and how they were feeling about what's being said. Okay. Um, so Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from the journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, as you're looking at this, you're saying, why, why is Jesus tired? Well, he's, I mean, how many miles did he just walk? He's been walking all morning. It's probably hot. It's noon. He's probably exhausted. Um, he's, he's on a pretty, pretty big journey. Uh, I, I didn't walk from Bolivar to get here. Okay, I drove. Um, in, in those days, you know, they were walking everywhere. And um, I, I imagine they were all quite a lot tougher than I am. You know, as an art professor, I, I'm not exactly the toughest person in the crowd. Okay. Um, but, but, you know, he would have been tired. You know, he was fully human, right? He was also fully God. But he had human limitations. He took those human limitations on. He's tired. Verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw well, uh, came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, remember, she's, a, she's from Samaria. She's, she's a Samaritan. You don't talk to them. As a Jew, you don't talk to them. You don't drink from their cups. You don't eat with them. This was a really radical move. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. There's another radical move. He sent his disciples into that city to get food. No, no, no. No, you should have packed a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, guys. Okay? You don't do this. You don't, you don't, it's unclean. It's risky. Okay, I think you get the idea. Uh, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now you understand that verse a little bit. Um, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. This is the face blindness. This is the prosopagnosia, right? This is her inability to know who she's talking to, and it really comes out very strongly here. She has no clue who Jesus is. If you knew the gift of God, Jesus is the gift, right? Didn't we just sing Silent Night a little bit ago, right? What a, and this is the first day of Advent, isn't it? 
for those of you who are interested in that stuff. Um, we're looking forward to the time when human beings here on earth first laid physical eyes on the birth of the Christ. Right? Well, here, this woman is able to see him, but not able to see him. The woman said to him, verse 11, The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Huh. That's, that's an understatement of the year, right? The well is deep. Are you kidding me? We're talking about God here. It's unsearchable. Right? She can't see it, but it's unsearchable. The well is infinitely deep. Okay? So, I guess we'll give her a little credit there. The well's deep. Okay? Uh, and you have nothing to draw water with. Well, the point is, is he's the vessel. Right? He, he, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember his baptism? He's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's going to pour himself out for his children. Are you greater than our father Jacob? Yes, I can't answer that. He gave us the well and drank from it himself and did, and, and did his sons and livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. So, yes, he's saying, yes, I'm, I'm greater than Jacob. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. I'm not sure if she's kind of joshing with him a little bit. You know, I, I, I'm, it seems to me like maybe she's like, all right, if you have that water, give it to me because I'm really sick and tired of coming out here to the edge of town, dragging these buckets out here, filling them up. Uh, all the time. It's weary, toilsome work, and I don't want to do it anymore. So if you can give me water that won't, I won't be physically thirsty anymore, I'd, I'd be happy to drink it. She can't see. She can't see. Still can't see, right? And that's my concern with us today too, right? You know, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here, right? I have a feeling that most of you are seeing, right? But I wonder if there's even more to see, but at the very least, there could be someone here that doesn't see yet. Just going through the motions, been doing this all their lives. So you need to do kind of a spiritual inventory and say, are you seeing? And if you're not, you need to pray. More on that later, I suppose. Jesus said to her in verse 16, Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. Now, what in the world? He just changed the subject, didn't he? N no, he didn't. <laughs> he didn't. I don't think he changed the subject. Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have five hus you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. What Jesus just did is he, he looked at her and he knew her. He knew her intimately, and he was showing her that. He was showing her that he knew her so well, he was... In effect, saying, I am able to give you living water, and let me prove it. I'm the divine Son of God. I know all about you. I know you better than you know you. Right? This would have, this, I imagine this would be shocking to have some strange, like, I couldn't do this to any of you, right? I couldn't just walk up to you and start telling you about your personal details. I could give you some big over, overarching sort of theological things like, hey, um, you know, you've sinned before, right? But I couldn't go and tell you, uh, you've, you've had five husbands. And by the way, these five husbands, maybe we shouldn't judge her too quickly because we don't, we don't know what happened to her husbands. Did, did they all die? Um, did, did, or was she, you know, is, is this kind of like a prostitution ring thing happening here? Like, we, we, we don't know what's happening. Um, but let me tell you, uh, the Jews in that time period uh, basically had this sort of rule that you couldn't have more than three husbands. Okay? And no matter what happened, it was just, it, they decided that somehow that you just a woman shouldn't have more than three husbands, uh, even if it's like they passed away or something, right? There was no good reason to have more than three. Um, so that was kind of a, a, a Jewish rule at the time. So, you know, now she, that kind of 
shows you kind of the social problems that she's dealing with, right? First of all, another big question is why is she even out at the well at noontime? That was kind of an uncommon time to be there. It's, it's hot, you know. Usually go there in the morning, get your water, maybe that kind of thing. So there's a lot of stuff happening in here um, that kind of shows, man, she, she's not just a Samaritan, but she might even be on the outcast within the Samaritans themselves. So she's an outcast of outcasts, it seems like, in a lot of ways. Um, verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Well, again, uh, yeah, I mean, he's a prophet. You're saying something true, but oh man, so much more than a prophet, is he not? Right? Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our father is worshipped on this mountain, that would be uh, the Samaritans worshipped on Mount Gezerim. Okay, they worshipped there, um, and they had the they had the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, but they didn't have the whole Old Testament like the Jews did. Okay, um, but you say in uh, that in Jerusalem, you as in you the Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Well, both of those statements were true. The Jews thought Jerusalem was the place because they have the full Old Testament. And the Samaritans, they, their, their tradition stopped because they were separated from the, from the Jewish, um, uh, the, the salvation history that God was working through the Jews first, but not to remain exclusively with the Jews, by the way, um, ultimately. So verse 20, are you following with me on this? There's a lot of interesting details. There's so much interest in here. It's, it's amazing. Um, I just love studying it, and I hope you guys do too. The, uh, the, I don't want this to be a pure lecture. I don't want it to be purely intellectual, but it's so important that you use your intellect and dig into these things sometimes, right? So verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. So, there, spirit and truth, spirit and truth, not, oh, you have to do it on this mountain or, the, oh, you have to do it in this physical temple, which, is, of course, has been destroyed. Um, it's going to be in spirit and in truth. Um, the woman said to him in verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. He who is called the Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So Jesus is claiming divinity. He is telling her. She pointed out that, you know, through her responses that she can't see. And he is telling her what she should be seeing. Right? He is teaching her. He is reaching her at the points of the mo her most personal interest. Right? Five husbands and one now that's not a husband. And also... The the, her theological confusion. Where, where do we worship? We, we need more revelation. We don't have enough revelation. We, we need the re revelation fulfilled. And Jesus is saying, I am the fulfillment of revelation. I am, I am the Christ. And all of Scripture points to Christ. All of the Old Testament points forward to Christ. Not just the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. So, how can you come to what you might call vital belief? Not the kind of belief that she had, which she had some details right, but she didn't have enough. How do you come to vital belief that this Jesus of the Scriptures um, is the Son of God? Right? How can you come to a saving belief in His name and His reputation, um, and His reputation alone, by the way, um, and, and have life? I want to tell you, it's not by your will. It's not by your will. It's, it's not of your own doing. Uh, I'm not telling you here that you need to somehow pull yourself up by the bootstraps. 
Uh, pull yourself up by these holy bootstraps and muster faith in your own power. I'm, I'm not saying that. Right? Uh, praise God, the story of the Samaritan woman at the well shows us that Jesus knows each one of us personally. He is going to work in your heart. If He's going to call you, He's going to work in your heart, and you need to be sensitive to that. You need to not be distracted. Remember I mentioned earlier about the distractions that I think we all struggle with probably, I bet. Everyone in here, I bet, struggles with distractions, whether it be work. I hate to say it, family. You can idolize your family. That is possible. Um, you know, Netflix. You, you name your distractions. You know what they are, okay? We all struggle with distractions. We need to be sensitive. We need to pray that God would make us sensitive so that we would understand how he's working in our hearts. And, and when he does that, you start realizing that he knows you better than anyone. And he will help you get to know yourself. I'm convinced that's what's happening with this woman at the well. She has these personal struggles, and he knows her. And she realizes that's, that's from God. Okay. So praise God. The story of the Samaritan woman at the well shows us that Jesus knows each one of us personally. He knows our personal flaws. He knows our theological confusion, because we all have some of that. We, none of us have perfect theology. He knows even our uncomfortable, shameful secrets. He knows about your five husbands and you know, one other, uh, that kind of thing. He knows that. He knows that you keep things in the dark. He knows what keeps you in the dark. He knows about our many imperfections better than we do. Uh, but he is gentle and he is loving and he is gracious. Jesus loves us anyway, despite all of our imperfections, despite shameful ways. He is willing to commune with us. He's willing to pour himself out for us. He's willing to, it, one day, I look forward to it, physically eating and drinking with us. He did it with them. He will do it with us. I like food. Thanksgiving, Christmas, you know, it's like some of my favorite times of the year. Good turkey. And, and, and uh, you know, I bought one of these pellet smokers, you know, so I can smoke brisket. I'm from Pennsylvania. Brisket's not like it, a Pennsylvania word. Okay. But you come out here to the Midwest, like, you know, oh, amazing. Okay. I like eating. I look, I look forward to eating with the Lord in person. Right. He's willing to do that. He poured out his blood for us. He will fill you with the Holy Spirit. Uh, reflect upon this story of the Samaritan woman and recognize God in Christ. Discover the divine, the divinity of Christ. See the ultimate Savior. Pray that He would open your eyes. More and more. We don't all have you, know, you might be saved, but there's still a process to go through, a process of growth, process of mat mat maturation, sanctification, right, in the faith. Um, pray that you would see more and more clearly, even if you already are seeing, uh, you know, it's the kind of uh, idea of, I believe, help my unbelief. If you're familiar with these verses, I believe, help my unbelief. I think that should be the disposition of all of us, even if we are believers, we shouldn't be arrogant thinking that we know it all. Witness the Son of God in the man Jesus. This divinely inspired story reveals to us who Jesus is. Know him and ask for his living water. Let him give you the living water. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, just let your living water well up in each one of us today. Let your living water well up to eternal life. We want you to know us. Sanctify us. Know us so that we might know you. That should be our prayer. That is, that, that, that is my prayer. So if you were to see the power of God demonstrated here and now, would you recognize him? I asked that question earlier. Behold, 
See the power of God in Christ, who knows us better than we know ourselves. See the one who gives of himself. He gives all of himself. He gave his life. If you were witnessing the hand of Jesus, would you know him? Behold, see the hand of Christ who offers living water. He is the one who gives living water. Jesus doesn't require an old jar for the well. He is the vessel. And it was broken, but he's been resurrected. Amen? Right? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for Christ, our only hope. Help us to see him. Give us, give us eyes to see. Help us to understand what we're seeing. Help us to understand what we're hearing as we study your word. Transform us. We are completely reliant upon you. We can't do this on our own. We can't even do it as a group of people. This whole church family needs you. Thank you, Jesus, for teaching us through your word, helping us to learn about this Samaritan woman, helping us to hear her story so that we can believe. Open our eyes to the truth. Help us to move throughout the week, showing people like that woman did with her friends back in Sikar. Help us to be witnesses to you, showing others through our words, through our actions, through our emotions. Use us to draw others to yourself. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.